Yay, now we get to look at load and load paths. Yay, 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 yay. All right, so these are the things we're going to take a look at today. Don't write anything down yet. Uh, but these are the steps, steps in structural design. Uh, after you plan it, um, then you have to actually calculate and establish loads that are going to be on the building to see if it'll actually stand up as a structural engineer. So design loads. This is one thing that um, you should record. This is a load that is assumed for the design of the structure. That's a design load, load that is assumed for the design of the structure. And they can include one or more of the following. So we've already looked a little bit at dead load and live load, but you also have snow and ice. Rain, flood, wind, earthquake, and earth pressure load. So please note all of these eight different design loads. First, dead loads. Uh, these are fixed loads. So again, you should already have a little bit of information on this. Add to it if you need to write this down. But it's basically the weight of the building components and then of all the service equipment, anything that is um, that cannot be removed from that building. So fixed service equipment, fixed is the key word. These pipes and some of this machinery, that's all fixed. That's not going to be um, really removed. These valves and things, they may be replaced but never really removed. Live loads are things that could be removed. Um, the occupancy, the use and occupancy of the building, variable things like tables and chairs and things like that. So if this is on a second floor, it would need to be designed for the load, um, the assumed maximum load of all these people and all of the food that they're eating. And the, those live loads are specified in building codes. So really these, um, these main two ideas here. Um, are the two big ideas. But if you already know that, if it's, you know, people and furniture and things, then you got that down. All right, a new one, snow load. Snow load is force of accumulated snow on the roof of a building. And these are specified also in building codes. It depends on location, exposure to wind, and importance of the building, and roof slope. So uh, importance of building isn't really what it uh, sounds like. It's not saying like one building is more important uh, than the other. But there's this thing called importance factor that we'll look at in a little bit. So, um, Roof slope is kind of a big thing, and then obviously location too. So if you were going to calculate, and don't write this piece down here, this is just an example. You're going to do one similar to this, but not with snow load. Um, these are all the different factors that you have to use. So PS, the design snow load, this is what it's going to tell you in pounds. How many pounds can this thing hold? So if this is your building, you have a very shallow slope, then you would need to calculate the design snow load. So there's a roof slope factor. That would be the slope right here. Uh, there's an exposure factor, um, the orientation towards the sun, if it's going to melt off or not. There is a thermal factor. Um, there's also an importance factor, and an importance factor, that's the one that we're going to take a look at when you do your, your practice one. And then the ground snow load also. So these would be things that you would look up in charts as a structural engineer, and then you can figure out what your design snow load should be. So this little sample um, just kind of shows you how something might be calculated, some of the information you might see when calculating. First, you find the ground snow load for Springfield, Colorado. So that's this red dot here, and we are in the 15 pound per square foot uh, region. So that's where we identify, you know, what the snow load is in this area. And then we can use some of these calculations. If it is above or below a certain amount, then you can see the importance factor um, has some criteria that we multiply by that PG which again is a ground snow load. So these are, it's, it's just kind of filling in the blanks based off information you find in charts. And again, we're gonna do a practice with that um, on, on sort of a different load calculation. So lateral loads, lateral loads, which is side to side, that has um, um, things that would qualify for that are wind loads, earthquake loads, flood, and earth pressure. Those are all lateral loads. So those would be things that you would want to note down. Lateral loads, identify those four things. And then here's a neat little picture. Yay, it's flooding, oh boo. And other design loads, you have wind load. If you have wind blowing over the top of it, you have a downward pressure here, but from aerodynamics, um, it turns out that as the wind comes over the top, it actually creates a negative pressure right here, and that uplifts this, so it tries to pull the roof right off. That's why in tornadoes, sometimes roofs get, roofs get ripped off. It's because of this, um, the aerodynamics involved in this, and that uplift on one side and a downlift on the other side. So. Um, winds cause lateral loads on walls, downward and upward pressure on roof, and they could overturn the structure. So it's important that these are specified in building codes. Earthquake loads. Earthquake loads are seismic forces at the base of the building, and they have vertical and lateral forces. They're kind of in all directions. So depending on where um, you live, building codes can identify what you need to have for earthquake loads in your structural design. 
There are also flood loads, lateral forces dynamic from static and dynamic water pressure, and building codes generally specify that buildings have to be constructed above the flood elevation or flood proofed. So there's flood loads. I mean, you want to design it to not, you know, collapse in that, um, but it's generally the first floor has to be above that. That's why you would use something like spread footings in those coastal floodplains so that the first floor is above it, but then that footing itself still has to be designed to withstand the flood loads and the water moving in. So base flood elevation, water surface elevation resulting from a flood with a 1% chance of equaling or exceeding that. So that is your base flood elevation. So you have a 99% chance every year that you will not flood. That's what base flood elevation means. So if it is not constructed above the flood elevation, then it has to be flood proof. This must be designed and constructed to be watertight to flood waters. And that can be pretty difficult to do because of water leakage and it's really difficult to drive flood proof. All right, soil pressure. As um, you get deeper and deeper underground, there's more and more pressure from all the weight of the dirt and soil above you. So it pushes in more and more and more. And so there is soil pressure in basement walls and these foundation walls. So that's why sometimes there are buttresses that these walls that are built out to the side of this thing to kind of hold that wall in. Um, it applies a lateral force. So structural engineers have to know, do we need to put a buttress? The deeper that your basement walls are, the more likely it is that you're going to have to buttress this thing in to keep that wall from collapsing in. So here's some load types. You have a uniformly distributed load. All of these panels, these floor panels, um, are uniformly distributed. So it makes it even across. A concentrated load is if it's only in one place. Now, load combinations. So something that, you know, maybe you can jot down on this as well. But these are some examples of load combinations. Um, and you might just even screenshot just this little piece here that depending on your region, you may have, a, you're always going to have the dead load of the structure. You're always going to have a live load of something that's probably going to be occupying. Usually you will, um, except for maybe like a wind turbine or, turbine or something like that that doesn't really have people in it. Um, and then you have, you know, a combination of a lot of, possible different things. So in, in this first example, it's the roof live load plus the snow load plus the rain load. So those are the things you have to consider. In this one, it's just the wind load. So depending on what the, the structure is, you may have different combinations of loads. The building dead load is the only known load. All the other ones will vary in magnitude, duration, and location. So like your snow load, it's not a known load. You have to look at charts and see where am I located, which way is it facing towards the sun, all those things, they can all vary. And that makes it challenging, and that's why structural engineers get paid. The building is designed for the design load possibilities that may never occur. But if you over-engineer it, it's going to be really expensive, and that causes problems on the construction phase. So. This is kind of where we're leading into load paths and chasing. You already did a little bit of this with your um, kind of historical structures. When you find a load path, it travels through the structural system. So you need to trace or chase the load. And each structural element must be designed for all the loads that pass through it. So the snow um, pushing down on the roof, those loads push outward. And then they are all attached to these columns or these walls that then push down. All the loads from the floors are also attached to the columns or walls. So these lower walls have combination of forces. They have to be stronger and stronger. So you can see these foundation walls are quite a bit stronger and probably made out of concrete. And the footings are even stronger and wider yet to have a larger area so there's less pressure. And then the, that's pushing down with the same pressure that the ground is pushing up on it. So these up arrows represent the total of all the downward arrows pushing down. That's Newton's third law, equal and opposite forces. So that's kind of what we're seeing here with these arrows. And then on this ground floor, this ground floor is kind of disconnected, so it's pushing up separately. Load pass, every load applied to the building will travel through the structural system until it is transferred to the supporting soil. This is incredibly important. And when you're talking about your bridges, all the loads on the structure travel through these beams to the girders and then to the columns at the end or in your case to the platform at the end at the very end of your bridge the two sides of your bridge have to hold everything so the entire load is being traced to that that's why it's so important that those pieces um, are, are really well built and so all the load on here is traced to these columns and so we're going to be doing some load path tracing so with structural elements individual structural elements must work together to carry and transfer the applied loads to the ground everything is transferred to the ground so some examples of structural elements include roof decking is structural elevated slabs if you have a second floor with elevated slabs load bearing walls connections 
beams, girders, columns, and footings. So on this you have beams, the girders are the long ones that connect to the columns, which go down to the footings. And that's where we're going to focus is beams, girders, columns, and footings. And now we get to take a look at load chasing. Yay!